So hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to talk about group fairness and some recent developments and challenges uh, in this field. Let me start off with a couple of motivating examples of machine uh, learning or data-driven systems uh, where we see a presence of some, some sort of bias uh, encoded implicitly inside of them. And the first one is the example of Google Translate. So here I'm translating from uh, Hungarian to French. And it happens that in Hungarian, there is no gender pronoun. So this means they don't have a word he or she. Instead, they have this letter O with, uh, with two accents, which roughly means the person. So we are translating pretty much the same sentences. The person uh, does something or the person has certain qualities. And we are translating to French where it, it's possible to say the person is something, but it doesn't sound natural. So in Google Translate make a choice of a gender. And you see that it's she who is beautiful, but it is him who is uh, smart. Um, it's she, she is the cleaner, but he's a politician. She, he earns a lot of money, but she cooks and so on and so forth. So it's very clear that there are uh, certain biases. Uh, so Google Translate makes a choice here and uh, it's very clear what kind of discrimination happens. It's uh, quite, uh, quite a sexist uh, way of translating, but it actually can go even in the other direction. So here it's against women. It can also go against men as well. So here um, it's an example of translation from Finnish where it's also possible to make a, a gender neutral sentence to English. And we see that uh, she's taking care of the child, but he hates the baby. She loves baby, but he hates his child. So it can go either way. And okay, so this is an example. You might say, uh, okay, it's, it's not that it doesn't really affect me directly, but let me try to argue that it can affect anyone. And just let's imagine a situation that you come to, to France, uh, you don't speak uh, French, but you still need to communicate with people in French. So you in particular need to write emails in French. And so here I'm translating from Russian to French and in Russian, uh, it's not gender neutral language. So there is a gender to each word. And I'm writing that I am a male student and I'm a female student. However, when Google Translate makes translation, uh, you appear to be a male student in both cases. So right now, if you're uh, communicating with someone in, in French, but you're making a translation from Russian to French, uh, your gender can be completely misspecified, which can lead to certain confusions. Uh, so the second example is, um, Quite famous right now, it's with Twitter cropping. So if you want to upload uh, an image to your uh, Twitter post, um, and this image is like say fairly large because of uh, quite um, because of the constraint of the of the size of the screen of the phone, uh, Twitter is going to crop this image and going to focus on some sub part of the image. So let's say we are uploading this uh, drawing of zebras, and that's some something like this you're going to see on your Twitter feed. So people started to test when you have two alternatives, what Twitter is going to choose. And here's an example. We have two images. So it's a, it's a long image, very artificial, but uh, these two images are completely the same. They have same alternative. The only difference is that people are flipped. Uh, so this person on the top here and on the bottom here. And the question, uh, how, how Twitter is going to crop them, where Twitter is going to focus. So essentially there are three alternatives, let's say uh, that man. Uh, black, uh, black part and uh, this man. So in both cases, uh, independently from the uh, from the orientation, it chooses uh, this white male. And well, you can say that uh, maybe we don't know, but who knows? Maybe this person is just simply much more famous than uh, than the other one. Maybe the, it's not an issue. So people made uh, more experiments uh, with uh, Barack Obama and Mitch, Ma Mitch McConnell. So in the US, probably Mitch McConnell is someone famous, but uh, in the whole world, Barack Obama probably is infinitely more famous person than uh, Mitch McConnell. But in both cases, it's not Barack Obama uh, where the, the Twitter focuses its image. And so Twitter acknowledged the issue. They explained uh, what kind of algorithm they use. And there were a recent paper in 2021 by, uh, by their researchers where they made a study of this type of biases. 
So uh, here you see the it's a there are two alternatives. They pretty much made the same experiment: black female, white female, black male, white male, and so on and so forth. And while the discrepancy is not that large, this discrepancy is there, and uh, it's hard to it's hard to deny it. And so, eventually, we come to natural questions: How can we adapt our our algorithms in order to try to avoid this type of situations, try to avoid this type of behaviors, not necessarily solve all the problems, but at least be uh, be informed and um, uh, try to uh, try to come up with some smart techniques. And so one way to do it is uh, through what people call group fairness paradigm, where we want to avoid discrimination based on certain sensitive, uh, sensitive attributes in our subpopulations. So typically in the learning, you have feature vectors and labels, and you want to, given a new feature vector, you want to predict the label. So in group fairness, we're just simply adding uh, one more variable, which we call sensitive attribute. Let's say it's uh, male or female or based on race, it can be height. So it doesn't, it doesn't really have to be something extremely obvious. It can be anything. Um, and the first thing to agree upon is uh, what kind of prediction functions we are going to use. So, and there are two alternatives. First one is called fairness through awareness. It simply means that uh, we are allowing ourselves to construct one prediction function per, uh, per sensitive attribute. So if it's a male and female, we are allowing ourselves to construct one prediction function for males and one prediction function for females. Uh, it does not mean that uh, we are discriminating, it just simply means that we are allowing ourselves to do uh, to, to build two functions and potentially we can enforce additional fairness properties on them. Unfortunately, uh, often due to legal reasons and regulations, you simply cannot do that. So you have to choose one function that you use for both males and females and you cannot you cannot have an access to the gender explicitly when you're making a prediction. So in that case, we are talking about fairness through unawareness. All right, so uh, you need to make a choice between these two and you need to understand uh, what is allowed in your given domain. Uh, second one, uh, the second thing to consider is the risk. And here we do not invent anything new. Typically, we consider standard risks. So if you talk about problem of classification, it can be accuracy or the probability that we are making an error. In regression, it can be a squared risk. And other uh, typical choices of risks are also possible. And the final thing uh, is the most interesting thing is the fairness criteria. So on the high level, fairness criteria is just a dichotomy of prediction functions. So we are going to call some prediction functions fair and some prediction functions unfair. And our goal is to build an algorithm which outputs a prediction function that is fair or close to be fair. In general, there are a lot of definitions of uh, fairness and of fairness criteria, but all of them can be pretty much uh, described by these three. The first one is independence. Here we are asking for the uh, the independence between the our prediction and the sensitive attribute. So it's a it's a true statistical independence, and it's a very natural constraint to ask for. Right, if you have sensitive information, we don't want this information to affect our prediction, so we just want to ask for an independence. Unfortunately, this constraint does not take, to, take into account the labels. So for instance, if the function f is fair with respect to this definition, uh, then it is fair independently from what kind of problem you're trying to solve. Are you trying to make a classification or regression or anything else? And to address that, people invented this separation where we again ask for the same independence of our prediction from sensitive attribute, but right now conditioned on the label. So if I know the label, then sensitive attribute does not matter to me. So in that case, you probably should trust your label. So your label should be some reflection of reality. And finally, so it's called sufficiency, and uh, so it pretty much resembles the standard uh, sufficient statistics uh, from you know, statistic course 101. Uh, we want Y uh, being independent from S, so the label being independent from the sensitive attribute, given our prediction, right? So it's a uh, direct parallel with the sufficient statistics. Okay, so we have these three definitions, and the question is, uh, so what, uh, do we choose one, do we choose two, do we choose three? And the first result that people talk about is the impossibilities. Uh, so essentially it says that unless your distribution is very specific, you cannot satisfy either two of them. So you cannot satisfy independence and separation, you cannot satisfy separation and sufficiency, sufficiency and independence you cannot satisfy neither. And the moral of that is that, well, Given your application, you probably should make a really informed choice of the what kind of fairness criteria you want to you want to enforce, right? Because you cannot you cannot have any two of them. 
And the more complicated direction is to explore actually the whole Pareto frontier of these three uh, definitions, because an impossibility tells you that you cannot satisfy them exactly. But what if you're fine to sacrifice a bit of independency to gain a bit of separation, and you're fine to sacrifice a bit of sufficiency to gain a bit of independence? So in that case, the problem becomes quite complex. You have three, uh, three criteria to play around, and um, you can start exploring the whole, the whole Pareto frontier of the three. Um, then let's assume that we managed to fix one definition. Let's say we choose independence and we believe that this is a good definition uh, for our application. And the question is, uh, what kind of approaches do we have in order, to, um, in order to achieve independence? And there are three different types. And the first one is called pre-processing. Pre-processing, the synonym of it would be fair representation. Essentially, we have our feature vectors. Let us find a transformation of these feature vectors, maybe in another space or in the same space, so that uh, the representation becomes independent of the sensitive attribute. So for instance, we can try to decorrelate, uh, decorrelate sensitive attribute from the representation. And the nice thing about this problem is that it's unsupervised. So in a sense, you can create a fair representation and then use any machine learning algorithm on top and you can solve any type of problem. So you can create fair representation and then work with classification, work with regression, work with anything else. And so there are, there are a bunch of ways to achieve it. So it can be, uh, as I said, linear models where you're trying to decorrelate. Once you're able to solve it with linear models, you can use kernel tricks and uh, go to kernel methods. And uh, it can be also based on uh, adversarial networks where we add uh, one one neural net which tries to predict uh, sensitive attribute based on the on the representation that we are constructing. So the second approach is called in processing, and this is um, somehow resembles standard machine learning idea where we are trying to minimize the risk, say empirical risk, uh, with two penalties. So the first one would be uh, for the complexity of the model, so it can be let's say. Uh, reach type penalty, lasso type penalty, on, or anything else. And we are trying to invent a second type of penalty, which uh, penalizes for unfairness. And then by tuning these two uh, parameters, lambda 0 and lambda 1, we are trying to find a good compromise between model complexity, between fairness of our model, and the accuracy. The, uh, the approach is, as I said, based on uh, regularized uh, empirical risk minimization, or if you consider this problem where you minimize and risk under additional constraint, you can think of it as a min-max game, and in that case, you can use some, something like multiplicative weight updates or exponential, uh, exponential weighting. Finally, uh, post-processing, so it's again quite a different way of seeing the problem. In that case, we are given some base algorithm F, and we think of this algorithm as something that we are currently using in production, right? But let's say we were not informed about uh, fairness issues, and right now we became informed. So we're asking ourselves, can we still use our base algorithm, but somehow try to modify it a little bit in order to gain some fairness properties? And so in the post-processing, you're trying to find some sort of a transformation of your base, of your base algorithm, uh, which eventually uh, makes your makes your current method fair. And from a theoretical perspective, it's somehow based on uh, the relation between two prediction functions. The first one is f star fair. So this is just a prediction function that minimizes the risk under the fairness constraint. And f star base, which minimizes the risk without any constraint. So typically, if you did not think about fairness before, then uh, your current algorithm tries to uh, mimic a star base. And right now, if you're able to establish a link between the two, you can construct this uh, kind of transformation and transform your current algorithm into something more fair and potentially improve guarantees about that. So for instance, in the case of binary classification, it often amounts to a threshold adjustment. So it means that uh, you just need to find a good threshold for the, uh, for the algorithm that outputs a number between 0 and 1 in order to make a fair classification. Uh, for more complicated problems like regression, uh, we typically explore some connections between, um, between fairness criteria and optimal transport, in particular with Wasserstein distance, or it can also be based by the connection with uh, conformal prediction uh, type uh, literature uh, using rank uh, and order statistics. 
So uh, I'll finish my presentation with some with some challenges uh, that uh, are still not completely clear, and uh, uh, it's it's an active area of research. So first one is in essentially uh, etap uh, zero. The question is: uh, so when I was presenting this group fairness paradigm, I told that we have sensitive attribute, but maybe a more natural question to ask is: what is my sensitive attribute? So I have my feature vector which components of it are sensitive. So uh, we need kind of a nice way to, uh, to learn the sensitive, uh, sensitive features. In some applications, they might be uh, obvious to specify, in some, maybe not. Uh, second uh, is uh, the robustness to distribution shifts. So let's say we have an algorithm that is fair right now, but tomorrow we have uh, I don't know, something happens, or in one month something happens, our distribution changes a bit, do we need to retrain, or we can uh, somehow from the beginning guarantee that we, we have accounted for distribution shifts as well. And finally, maybe the most important question out of the world is how to kind of efficiently and clearly communicate uh, the research that happens in machine learning in this uh, field of fairness uh, with, uh, with legal practice, with lawyers, and with legal scholars, how to adapt um, how to adapt our laws in order to make um, fairness uh, research and fairness useful in uh, in real world and so uh, on this note uh, i'll finish so thank you for your attention and i will leave you with this document published by european commission uh, in april which tries to make some steps towards the regulations of artificial intelligence thank you mm -hmm.